Thank you so much. I, I have no idea what uh, was just said to introduce me, so I apologise that I don't speak Swedish, but hopefully we are united by code. Um, it's a real honour to be here today, to be with the uh, Digerati of Stockholm, uh, to be able to kind of share my personal journey in business, in technology, and why I believe that the future is being written in lines of code, and I think we are all a very important part of that journey. So, a kind of obvious question, but hands up in this room the number of people who have a smartphone in their pockets. Yeah, uh, exactly. I'm guessing it's everyone. Technology is becoming ubiquitous. And even in uh, places that currently struggle with access, it's predicted that up to 85% penetration of smartphones by 2020. This is transforming the way that we do so many things, the way that we shop, the way that we communicate, the way that we bank. Um, sometimes I think, looking at my team, that the most transformative thing is the way that we date. Um, they're constantly using Tinder. There are about one billion swipes left and right on Tinder every single day. And this, look at the science fiction of yesterday. It's becoming a reality today. This is Tesla's vision of our driverless car future. Um, I think it looks rather romantic, personally. Um, but, you know, it's not just replacing the jobs, it's changing the very spaces around us and how we use our time. Does anyone recognize this image from Minority Report? Technology is becoming smarter than us. Predictive tools, uh, artificial intelligence are being used by governments and security firms today to predict where crime is going to happen, when it's going to happen, by whom, and before it's even happened. Potentially terrifying. And again, hands up in this room, how many people have experienced virtual reality? That's a lot of hands, that's great. I mean, I'm so passionate about this technology. It's really hard to describe it to people who haven't actually put a headset on or experienced it, about how disruptive it's gonna be. For people, it feels um, that they say, this is better than reality. And it's quite interesting to think about society where virtual reality is actually better than reality. Um, I did ask one of my friends how long they'd actually spent in the real world one day. They'd spent about a quarter of their day in VR. So, I mean, there are some serious questions that um, we're asking ourselves here. The, you know, the world of education is changing. This, this guy needs a job. Um, at the Future of Work Summit recently, it was predicted that, you know, they were debating, is it up to two-thirds of graduates leaving higher education feeling totally ill-equipped for the world of work that they're going into? Potentially. And there was a brilliant piece of research that came out recently by the Oxford Martin Institute that predicted that 47% of jobs which exist today could be easily replaced by machines in the next 10 years. I wanted to have a little closer look at that piece of research because I was quite interested to find out whether men or women were more easily replaced by machines. I'm still actually working on that piece of research, but I did discover which jobs were least likely to be replaced by machines, so I thought it was quite handy to know what these jobs were. And um, you have a choice of two tutus. <laughs> you can go into the clergy, or you can become a choreographer. You know, what does that mean? You know, this is about kind of purpose, real meaning, and also about pure human creativity as being irreplaceable by machines. So what's happening? Every single industry, every single sector, every single one of our jobs, every single one of our behaviors are being radically impacted by technology. We know that, and what underpins it? I mean, this image for me kind of elicits a lot of different things. It's the ones and zeros, it's the codes, it's the languages behind the screen sending instructions to machines. And how does that make most people feel? Like this image looks absolutely terrified. And they feel that that kind of person owns it. Yet how many of us can confidently say that we understand the languages behind the screen? I know that I'm here with an incredibly technology literate audience, but come on, hands up who can confidently say that they understand the languages behind the screen in this room. That's one of the best shows of hands that I have ever seen. I've asked that question a lot of times. I would take a guess that about 1% of the world could say that they understand the languages behind the screen. So that feels wrong. There's a disconnect. There's a divide. And rewind to uh, 2011, I was kind of pondering on that in a very grotty bar in East London, thinking, I'm passionate about technology. This is affecting everything. I want to learn about it. And we struck on this idea. 
Um, number one, learning was quite odd for me because I wasn't the biggest fan of learning, but I tried to search about what was the learning experience that was really simple, really easy, really fun, really transformative, and it stayed with me forever, like learning to ride a bike for the first time. And what's a learning experience that takes fear and transforms it into something that is pure excitement, a little bit like this cat is experiencing right now? And that's what we wanted it to feel like. You know, why isn't technology education absolutely mind-blowingly amazing? Why doesn't it feel like that? And we set ourselves a challenge. You know, is it possible to teach someone, could I learn code? And really, really quickly, could I even do it in a single day? And so that was the challenge that we set ourselves. And there were quite a lot of challenges in this journey. The first one is that um, I didn't actually study uh, computer science. I studied classics. So I studied a different code. I studied Latin and ancient Greek. Um, so I was passionate about languages. I'd studied um, Japanese, Mandarin, French, but I hadn't studied the language of now, the language of billions. So for me, technology was just another language. And I think it's really fascinating to look at the backgrounds of the people who now I, I have the pleasure of working alongside. Um, yes, there are nanotechnologists, there are physicists, um, lots of PhDs, but there are also musicians and artists and philosophers and linguists, people who discovered technology and code through their need to create, their need to create something. Now, this image also brings to life a big challenging moment for us, a pivotal moment. Um, in, in about December 2011, it was really, really hard. No one seemed to want to learn about this. And uh, I got invited to speak at the first ever technology conference that I had been invited to, and it was, it was incredibly daunting. Uh, it's called the Dublin Web Summit. I'm sure many people here have been. And I was petrified, and, and I, I got in the taxi on my way there, and, and the taxi driver said to me, you know, what do you do? Because taxi drivers ask you that question. And I said, well, I could teach you, um, I could teach you to code. I could teach you um, how to code in, in a day. And um, he really wasn't that interested. So um, yeah, uh, I was like, but you know, I was kind of feeling I need, I need to convince this guy. And so by the by the end of the trip, I started saying to him, this is something that is gonna, you know, really transform you. It's gonna change the way that you look at the world, but it's also gonna change the way that the world looks at you and so on and so forth. And by the end of the journey, it was incredible because he actually wanted to learn. And that was a real moment for me. And I got out of that taxi and I felt so pumped. I was so excited until I suddenly realized that he thought I taught people how to make coats, like these shiny things here. And he really wanted to learn how to make a coat. And I said I was going to teach him. And it, but it was the most enthusiastic response I'd had for, from anyone. So I was thinking, uh, all right, maybe bin this code thing, let's do coats. But it was a very important, humbling moment because I suddenly realized, do you know what? Nobody cared. Nobody cared at all about this. And so at that moment, we realized that we weren't going to have to just you know, become this kind of these educators, we were going to have to become campaigners as well and start getting on stages and getting out the technology sphere and going into schools, going into governments, standing on the street with megaphones. And so really, if I could encourage anything from today, it would be the power of a campaign is so incredible. If you have a campaign within you, please, please unleash it, especially if it's technology related. Now, here's another challenge. Uh, where are the chicks? That happened earlier today, didn't it? Where are the chicks? Now, I can see lots in this audience, but this is the queue to the women's loo at a technology conference. Yeah, the one with no one kind of in it. And what is happening? You know, some of the earliest pioneers in computer science were women. And something's happened in the last kind of 10, 20 years where women are opting out of technology in their droves, not just at school in STEM subjects, but actually at career level, opting out of technology careers. It wasn't something that I'd observed so much until I realized that we taught tens and tens of thousands of people, and 50% of them were female. There is a desire to learn. And I kept on hearing this phrase that somehow women's brains just didn't quite work that way, and that's why they weren't in technology. No, no, I hear that a lot, at least once a week. Um, so I thought, well, this is nice, 50-50 research base. I can actually have a look at some of our data and see if there's a difference between a man and a woman's ability to computationally think. And guess what? No difference. 
but there is a huge difference, up to 30% less confident that they will succeed. But they do succeed, and that feeling is incredible when they do. So what can we do about this? I believe that the future is being written in lines of code. Does it even matter? Well, we've, we've taught in over 45 different cities in the last year alone. And I can tell you the thing that businesses are looking for, not just digital skills, but digital confidence and digital literacy. So code, for me, has become a bit of an economic issue, but it's also become a feminist issue. So claim your digital votes, and please encourage all the women around you to do the same too. So that was 2011, and a lot has changed. Fast forward to 2015, you know, code, code is global. We've gone global. The decoded kind of element of what can you demystify from code to data to hacking. There are so many digital dark arts that people really desperately want to understand, and it touches every single industry. This is something we thought that would appeal to creative minds, people who wanted to create, but it's every single industry, every single sector, from seven-year-olds to 70-year-olds to boards of big businesses. And look at this, incredible change from people not even knowing what the word code means to actually being introduced onto curriculums globally and being debated. And I know that that's happening in Sweden today, and there's incredible uh, Coda Dojo, or the maker clubs. There's a big movement around this happening. And I'm personally incredibly proud to be part of the UK's efforts to make coding mandatory on the national curriculum. So teaching hundreds of teachers and distributing free learned code materials to hundreds of thousands of students. For me, this really matters. And what a shift that we've got to that place. But there's also been a massive shift in attitudes of business. And it's something that I've really seen in the last six months. I would say six months ago, I couldn't have talked about this. When I talk to the boards of these big companies, these traditional businesses, which are the majority of the world, they would say, why do I need to understand what's under the car bonnet in order to drive the car? There was such a divide between them and the people creating the technologies, fundamentally disrupting their entire industries. This is actually Tesla's factory. It has 10 of the biggest robots in the world, and they're all named after X-Men characters, so I just quite like this image. Um, but it also brings to life the fact that the conversation has fundamentally changed to not am I being digitally transformed, or do I need to understand digital transformation? It's how do I kill my business? They're seeing the disruptive impact of technology upon all their industries, and suddenly they not only want to learn, but they want to understand how they can be the ones actually killing their own businesses rather than it happening to them. There's also a war for talent. So um, this is one of the faces of that war. Uh, he was 15 when I met him. His name's Jordan Casey. He is a self-taught coder, uh, CEO of his own games company, being flown around the world by Apple, speaking in front of crowds of thousands of people. I mean, he is the, the archetypal image of the young genius coder. And I mean, every week I'll get emails, CVs, links to work that's been created by people that I say, come into the office, and they'll email back and say, I need to ask my mum. <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know, this kind of new generation, and very, very exciting. But I think there's a real red herring in this as well, because we can't wait for a generation to grow up to change now. The change is needed now. And I do actually think that there are technologists within a lot of people who have put technology to one side and opted out of it. And sometimes if you reframe it as creativity, persistence, problem solving, a skill set like that, suddenly people start putting their hands up and saying, I can do that. I can be a technologist. And the, you know, guess where? They've all got slides now. And I know that Stockholm has some pretty cool offices when it comes to technology companies with ping pong tables and all the rest. But people are saying, how do I compete with this? How can I compete as a small business or as a traditional business with the Googles of this world? They're offering, you know, slides, swimming pools, uh, like, you know, soft couches and a food times infinity. And let's not even get onto the salaries. You know, one, one company came to London recently and started hiring designer developers at times 10 the salaries that they were getting in their existing businesses. Well, I think you can compete, because I think that this one image is conveying one message, which is play. How do you create an environment where technologists you know, feel welcome, that actually you've got a sign above your door that says, we speak your language? 
are you letting them play? Are you letting them use things like Kaggle? Are you allowing them to actually you know, converse with the leadership in that business in the same language? And for a lot of companies, that isn't happening. There's too much of a disconnect. And you know, so for me, I think a lot of what the architecture is saying is saying about a freedom, a culture that lets you do things and create things. And people can forget that technologists are some of the most creative people that exist. And they want to, just like artists, or like a copywriter, you don't want to write a thousand lines of code that never sees the day, day of light, that never actually reaches a human being or a consumer. These are creative minds. They want to create. Let them create. And finally, I think we're living at a really special moment in time. And I think we're going to look back in 50 to 100 years and really kind of notice it and see what happened. It's, it's a renaissance. It's a learning revolution. You can actually learn anything online that you want now. And I'm really seeing individuals take their personal learning to, to a very, very kind of meaningful place where they want to make themselves fit for business in an economic age. But also businesses are rethinking learning. It's not that kind of, you know, perk of a nice away day. It's being seen as absolutely core to the capability building of their businesses. Now, um, Plato's in the middle of, of this picture somewhere here. And um, uh, above the doors of Plato's symposium were written the words, um, let he who knows not geography not enter. So I think there are fundamental difference uh, with, with this kind of learning revolution, which is there is no he in it. Um, and as Tim Berners-Lee said, this is for everyone. And finally, for me, I am a utopian, really, when it comes to technology. I just feel that if you understand it and you've got a little bit of the skills and the tools, really, and you know what problem you want to solve, anything is possible. And certainly our mantra when we started, I was saying, um, you know, we started very much, it's incredible that you've got all these companies pitching later today, that there's an environment of investments. That simply didn't exist, for example, in London about four or five years ago. We just had a dream, we had a mission, and we believed that we could do it. And so my favorite quote, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And what are your impossible challenges? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, taken by surprise. <laughs> I'm still thinking about two more minutes or so. <laughs> now, um, you were talking about, about uh, coding as a part of the national curriculum. How far, or rather, how close do you think you are right now? You're working with it, and when will it be reality? Mm. Uh, it's a very interesting question, like the reality. So it was made mandatory in September 2014 on the UK national curriculum, and it's a really great curriculum. Um, the challenge is always how do you actually create an environment that empowers teachers mm. to teach something that they may have never taught before? And not just across, let's say, ICT, but as much as, you know, I said I believe this is a creative medium, across arts, across geography, across every single subject. So it's how do you now create a supportive environment for teachers that have to teach something very new in the classroom? Yeah, yeah because you, you, you need to start with the teachers, because otherwise they can't do anything about yes. it. Yes. Yeah. So Mons will like this because he's uh, teaching scratch in our office. Amazing, I have. Yeah. It's, a, it's, been a, it's been a challenge, and one of the things that we have um, spent a lot of time thinking about is how we can take this to all the schools, to all the kids everywhere in Sweden. Yeah. And I know that UK was one of the countries that has taken steps towards making it mandatory in schools. And, yeah. and right now, it's a discussion here whether we should do it. So you think it's a good idea? For me, I feel that if you expose young people to a whole variety of different things. Um, what's great about it at a young age is they might discover that they really enjoy it or that they actually have a real aptitude for it. Um, take away the, the, the very real issues about the numbers of programmers and developers that are actually emerging out of education, uh, but also the need for deep digital literacy. This is just about exposing young people to something that is really relevant, really fun, mm -hmm. and they might be amazing at. And so for me, I, I just don't buy the debate. Yeah. It should be on the <laughs> curriculum. I could talk to you uh, all day about this, but I have one more question. Uh, I've struggled a lot with getting uh, girls to sign up, and then I started 
thinking, it's not actually the girls that sign up, is it? It's their parents. Why is it that parents of girls, apparently, still don't see the need to teach their daughters how to use computers and code today? What do you think? Well, I think... Um, it's an attitude, it's a norm. What yeah. do we do to combat this? I think there's a confusion between using technology and uh, understanding the technologies that you can actually create with and build with. And, uh, but also, similarly, how do you create um, as many free resources like Co.org did and whatever you can create to actually empower parents in quite a scary environment. You know, it's technology actually scares a lot of people. And how can you create as many? It's such a big problem. It does need a community to solve it, mm. collaborating. So getting together with, I know you've got geek girls here and all the different communities to, to try and find different ways to actually encourage girls to embrace technology. Um, I think for me, it's a big, um, the stereotypes and the myths and the cliches are the things that are easiest to tackle and change mm -hmm. and actually make it aspirational, yeah. make it something that young people want to do. Yeah, let's, let's try to do that together. Yes, yes let's all do it together. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for an thank amazing you. speech. Thank you very much. Thank and you. before you leave, we have a special yes. prize, special award, special <laughs> gift for you. Oh. We've made a little movie to show what it's all about. Oh my gosh. We at the Internet Foundation in Sweden love makers and believe that knowledge provides new possibilities. A few months ago, a young maker got arrested for taking his home-built clock to school. This is not how the world should be. So we let a bunch of 14-year-olds build their own clocks as gifts for our keynote speakers. Young minds like this strengthen our belief that the Internet should be both free and open for all. So welcome oh to stage, uh, Rika Dahlstrand, with your clock that you will have to take oh home gosh. with you. Uh, as you That's could see so in the picture, amazing. we had 14-year-olds build it, and plenty oh. of girls there who love to build a Is clock too, so it's great. Also? Yes. Oh, amazing. Thank yes. you. Mo? Moa. Yeah. Moa. Yeah. Thank you, Moa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so cute. <laughs> ja. Den här keynoten var den sista keynoten för internetdagarna i år.